What's up guys, it's me, Rosal Munchausen, and today, welcome to the third and final part to my King of Fighters 14 story, story theory basically. Now of course I know that um, people have been uploading gameplay of the story mode and stuff like that, and personally I don't approve of that, because um, SNK stated wait until the game comes out, which the game comes out tomorrow by the way. So they said, wait for the game to actually come out, don't don't spoil anything, but of course, no one listened. And it kind of took away from me doing this story for a while, like, I wanted to upload it last week. But people were uploading so much, you know, gameplay footage and story footage, that I was like, what, what's the point? But, um, yeah, anyway, this is the third theory, and final one. Now, it's not the final theory for... For King of Fighters as a whole, I'm going to be doing a whole lot more King of Fighters theories in the future to come. But this one, I thought about a whole lot, and there's just no denying it. In this one, I'm going to get, tell you guys the ones who are responsible for the King of Fighters 14 coming into being. You ready? Ready to get your mind blown? Here's one of them. Boom. Now you're probably thinking like, what? That's crazy. Not really, once I start bringing things down to you. So yeah, Ash Crimson, he is one of the reasons why King of Fighters 14 is able to come into being. Next up, we have... That's right, Saki. Saki is another person responsible for the King of Fighters 14 coming into creation. Now there are a few more I'd like to list, but one, I'll just name one of them. Another one is Shion, and you'll know why later. Now you're probably figuring out, like, you're trying, you're probably trying to put together how do Ash Crimson, Saki, and Shion have anything to do with, um, the King of Fighters 14. Ash was erased from history, Saki presum presumably died, quote unquote died, and Shion is trapped in another, another dimension. Yes, 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 and yes, that all is seemingly true. But, at least for Ash Crimson's case, we know for a fact that he is still alive. The ending of KO 13 for Team Team Japan for Team Japan or Team Yagami. You clearly hear him say, well, see him say, as Kyo and Iori start fighting, nothing's changed. Now, if someone's dead, he should not be saying that. So Ash was still around, just not physically in form or body. For Saki's case, I have no idea. His fate is unknown. And Shion, I've already stated in the past theory that Shion is back and is probably now the new head of those from the past. Who I also believe have a huge part to play in this. Especially with the way Kukri lo looks. But, um, let's get this going. Now, Ash is the real reason why King of Fighters 14 is able to come into existence. Now, for those of you who don't remember Ash, he was introduced in the King of Fighters 2003 as the main protagonist of the Ash Saga. Now, a whole lot of people did not like him due to the fact that, you know, said acting as a protagonist like, you know, Kyo or Kadash, he acted like an anti-hero and sometimes an antagonist. People thought he was actually the bad guy. And Falco himself stated that Ash was made to uh, to be the type of character that you feel bad for cheering for him. Falcon said that himself, and he made Ash. He said that Ash was made to the point where the player would feel bad for cheering for him, which says a lot, honestly. <laughs> right, what was that? But anyway, so yeah, Ash was introduced in King of Fighters 2003. In that game, he took the powers of Chizuru, the Yatsu Mirror. And the next main game of the franchise, King of Fighters 11, he took the powers of Iori. The 13th was the, th was the third and final part of the saga, in which he took Saki's powers, but also got possessed and eventually ended up getting erased from history all in its own. So what does this have to mean? Like, we, we all hate Ash. What, what are you talking about? We, we don't care. Well, actually... Ash is probably the most tragic hero besides Kadash in the entire series. As we know, um, from his background wise, he lost his parents to a mysterious fire. 
end up getting raised by the Bland Torch family. And now the Ash Saga. As I point out, I feel like this saga is definitely going to go back to the Orochi Saga at some point. But um, the Ash Saga was almost a, an exact retelling of the Orochi Saga, except for there being, except for there weren't three families. There were two: the Crimson Family and the Bland Torch Family. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be an interesting one. But Ash lost his parents, his family, to a mysterious fire at his mansion, which you can actually play at that mansion in KOF 13. Oh, fight there at least. Lost his parents to a mysterious fire, fire, and the Bland Torch family took him in due to the fact that they had tithes with the Crimson family. And took him in, raised them, and constantly reminded him of his mission. What was that mission, you ask? Well, I'm going to put it bluntly, to end those from the past, to put an end to Saki and those from the past. That was the mission. The, those from the past were a western equivalent to the Hakushu, Hakushu, you know, Orochi's clan. And just as equally dangerous, if not more so. Now, let's look at the details of this fire. As we know, the Crimson and Blend Torch family really don't have any dealings with the three main clans. The Kusanagi clan, Yasukani, aka Yagami, and Yata clans. They have no dealings with those whatsoever. Because they're Western, those clans were Eastern. So they had no dealing with them, which means they, that would give none of those clans any reason to attack Ash's home. That's right, they, that gave, gives them no reason to attack Ash's home whatsoever at all. But, if you remember who I said that they were trying to get rid of, they are trying to get rid of Saki and those from the past. Sure, you could say, well, it was a fire, right? It could have been the Yasukani clan or stuff like that. No, it wasn't them. Saki is the true reason why Ash's family is dead. Saki killed Ash's parents. And while he doesn't say anything on this, who else would have any reason to remove a threat to his plans? And Saki hates when his plans are interrupted, put at risk, all those things. Saki is the reason why Ash grew up without knowing, without his parents, without knowing his parents. He's the reason why Ash had to go to the Bland Torch family. Now, Ash at some point figured this out, because as we know, as Chaos 13 goes into more detail about Ash's character, at first he was a happy kid, you know, happy go lucky, enjoyed his life with his new family, new family. And. He, he loved he loved who he was, he loved what he did. He had fun. But as I said that he switched at some point, started becoming distant and cold. Referring to, you know, Elizabeth as annoying. You know, breaking away from the family constantly, going out. He just did an all sudden turn, and I believe that he found out what caused the demise of his family, what caused his home to be burned to the ground, all that stuff. He found out that it was those from the past, and it was Saki. In KOF 2003, remember, he was manipulating his two teammates then, and he manipulated his teammates in KOF 11, and in the 13, he was all by himself completely. Ash knew who was responsible for his parents' deaths. Ash knew that Saki was behind so much stuff, and... He had to make a difference. He broke away from, you know, the Bland Torch family. He broke away from Elizabeth. And he went out as a lone wolf, literally. And those he did take in, he played them. He used them. Now, I know those are some pretty pretty big claims. But then, here's where, it get, here's where the things get bigger. Ash's true purpose. We all think that... Well, I've already explained this to um, another friend of mine, uh, Silver Moon. But most people think that Ash did everything that he did in the sagas for no reason. They thought he just took Chizuru's powers for no reasons. They thought he took Iori's powers for no reason. People thought he was going for Kyo for absolutely no reason. They all, if anything, they thought he was going to give it to Saki. That was not the case. And it, it just wasn't the case. From what we are given in the story, you're about to find out why he did all this. You see, um, as we all know, 
as I said, the Ash Saga is a complete retelling of the Orochi Saga, and Orochi was becoming very much active in the Ash Saga, to the point that Chris was unsealed, and Yashiro and Shermi came back as well. And again, it was confirmed that Chris was sealed away alongside Orochi after the events of KOF 97. Chris wasn't dead, neither is Shermi. And I still say that Shiro isn't dead, but I don't know. But, um, the Orochi team is not dead. They came back as soon as the seal was broken. And as we all know, for someone with the Orochi bloodline, they don't need the seal to be broken to come back to life at all. Even Gain is still around, as you find out in the Young KOF Maximum Impacts novel. That takes place in between KOF Maximum Impacts 1 and Maximum Impact 2 goes into detail more about the characters and stuff like that, and it states that Gaius himself, his spirit was still around and was talking to Ninyan Beard, Minyan's little sister, teaching her all about the dark arts and dark magic and stuff, but yet didn't know what his actual name was, but knew his Heavenly King title. So Gaius himself was definitely still around. But, um... Again, the Ash Saga was a retelling of the Orochi Saga, so Ash is going around collecting the three sacred treasures, the things needed to seal Orochi, and the things that could be used to kill Orochi, possibly. Saki wanted it destroyed, because he didn't want Orochi to, you know, be sealed away again. No, he wanted Orochi's powers. Ash knew this, as he specifically states that to um, Shroom and Rimi, I think her name is, that once Saki gets what he wants, it's not going to end well for all the other followers, all these other followers, no. And that, you know, he says that everyone's smart, including Saki, but he's the smartest one. He's he's one who knows what's really going on. Now, why would Ash say that? Does he know some future event that's going on? Like, possibly, I don't know, a demon coming to take over and destroy the world? You know, it, it raises questions. But as y'all know, in KO 13, Ash failed to get Kyo's power. And instead went straight for Saki after you beat him. He took Saki's power, and now here's where it gets interesting. Now Ash has the ability to go through time. Now Ash has the ability to control time. Which means that since Saki, which also points out the fact that why he didn't disappear. Oh, that, that sounded horrible. It also points out the fact why he didn't disappear right away after, you know, killing Saki and taking his power. He had Saki's power, literally. He had Saki's power, I'm guessing a portion of his soul too. And by doing that, he was able to stay in existence. He completely removed the head of those from the past, therefore completing a one part of his mission. But Ash's focus wasn't those from the past, his focus wasn't Saki's followers. Here's where it gets interesting. Ash's focus was Orochi. And as I said, I believe Orochi and this demon have ties. So this is all going to play out together. Ash wanted Orochi. And I don't mean the fact that you know he's trying to become Orochi or take his power. No. Ash's goal was to kill Orochi. Yes, that's right. Ash's goal was to kill Orochi. And because... <clears throat> But because of the fact that, you know, he didn't have Kyo's power, he had to compromise. He had to go for the next best thing, possibly, and that was Saki's power. Because he couldn't do everything without so Saki anyway. He would need Saki's power to go back in time. And since Saki is technically very, very powerful, Saki's power should have been more than able to make up for him not having, for Ash not having Kyo's. So Ash was literally going to go back in time kill Orochi and stop the events of, you know, the Yagami clan getting cursed with the Dark Flames. You know, stop the whole, end the rivalry between the Kusanagi and Yagami clan and things like that. He was going to end Orochi completely. How do we know this? Look at the story carefully. Look at each story about Ash that you were given from KOF 2003 to KOF, to KOF 13. Those go the most into detail about what Ash was trying to do. He was going to end Orochi permanently and stop a whole lot of the events that happened in the, in the KO of Sagas from actually happening. Ash himself was going to change the course of history for the better. 
he acted like an anti-hero and an anti-villain, but the truth was he was truly a protagonist. He wasn't wasn't an anti-protagonist like it should have said in his bio. No, it specifically stated that he is the protagonist. He just did his things in really messed up ways. <laughs> so... It, it's a lot, I know, but Ash is... Ash isn't actually as bad as everyone thought. Sure, what he what he did about the way he went about everything was messed up, but in the end, his means were completely pure, and he succeeded in a part of his mission. He got rid of Saki, but the sad thing was he couldn't get rid of those from the past, and he couldn't go back in time to stop a Rochi from ever becoming a threat. Basically, it's insane, I know, but it was his goal. Why was he stopped? It's because Saki took over his body. Saki took over, had another battle, and then Ash refused to move. He refused to go back out the gate and rewind time. Thus, uh, thus you know, trapping Saki in the present. And Ash apparently disintegrating from being erased from history. And let's think, also let's look at this. Ash does state in his final moments that, you know, it wasn't supposed to end the way it did. He didn't go into full detail, which SK did this on purpose, mind you, because think about it. They knew that Ash was hated, so no one would pay attention to what his actual goal was. He, Ash stated that it wasn't supposed to end like this, and that basically, you know, he still had something else that he needed to do, and that was to get rid of Orochi. He didn't want to die. He wanted to stay and live. He wanted to stay with Betty at that as he calls her, Elizabeth. He wanted to stay with her, he, but due to the fact that you know, he trapped his ancestors about that, he couldn't do anything else. It was over. His plan, The rest of his plans failed. What Ash was going to do in the end, he was going to turn himself basically into the most powerful warrior in the KOF franchise. He was going to be the most powerful hero in the franchise as a whole. And I know, I mean, I'm serious, it sounds crazy, but I'm not... I have no reason to bullcrap you at this point. Ash is going to turn himself into the most powerful character in the franchise. And... It's amazing, really. It really is. Because he would have had all three of the sacred treasures, plus Saki's power. And he's going to take on Orochi. And possibly take Orochi's power for all you know. Which means that any threat, including this demon, that came along, Ash himself would be able to take on and fight. I know, I'm getting deep now. <laughs> but literally, with all this power, Ash himself, by himself, single-handedly, could have taken on every threat that could have came to the world. Could have killed off the Hakushu completely. Ending the Orochi bloodline permanently, which means he would remove Orochi as a threat, as a whole in the saga. And then still travel through time, possibly kill Geese Howard and every other KO villain, including Rugal and so many others. And change the events. So Ash himself was going to end KOF as a whole. He was going to make sure everyone lived normally. And what gives into that fact? Well, the, the, the ending gives Team Japan and Team Yagami. He clearly states and says things haven't changed. And time, I mean, time hasn't changed. He says in his sing-song, taunting voice, but he clearly said, and time hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. That was his hint, basically, that... Hey! <laughs> I failed. I wasn't able to change this. I wasn't able to change Iori's fate or Kyo's fate. No one's fate. Ash realized in the end that he failed to do what he was hoping to do. And that was change the events of history. It even states that he let go of Iyori and Chizuru's powers when he died. Oh, the deck vanished, should I say. He let go of their powers. He didn't keep it. And he... And to me, that's a big enough hint saying that Ash himself could have held on to those powers even during the time he was being erased. And could have, Iyori could have lived normally. Chizuru could have lived normally. All these people. But he kept Saki's. Keep that in mind. Keep it in mind. He kept Saki's powers. 
He could have easily left Saki's powers out and gave it to, give it to anyone he wanted to, but he kept Saki's powers, which allowed him to keep his existence. Even after vanishing, it allowed him to keep most of his existence intact, his consciousness at least, intact so that he could still actually talk and make comments on what's happening in the actual physical realm that he is no longer a part of. Which means that even in supposed death, Ash is still a major genius and still has so has his goals. And I'm telling you this now, guys. Now, this, is, this isn't a fact. Anything like that, but Ash is going to come back. S and K left his story completely like unknown. They left his reasoning unknown in most cases. A whole lot of stuff is still missing. So Ash himself is going to be back. With no if, ands, or buts, or maybes. He is coming back to the franchise. And I'm just saying that now, and I know he's gonna come back. Again, I don't know anything about the story-wise for KL14, but I do know for a fact Ash is coming back. The Orochi team is coming back. Um, Shion is definitely coming back, and I'll give give you reasons into that. And Saki also possibly may be coming back because he was trapped in the present, which means that he too is possibly still around somewhere, and his existence is still somewhere out there. So these characters are coming back, and by the way, it looks for KOF 14, this is going to be a flat out war. You know, again, you have the Orochi team, you have those from the past who are still around, mind you. They are still around. Then you have this demon. This is going to be a war. A war that Ash was going to stop in the long run. See, this is now. I got your interest now, didn't I? Ash is going to put an end to all this before he even had a chance to begin. Why do you think that in KO 13, it wasn't called. The intro song was not called The Final Battle. It was called The Ultimate Battle. KO 13 is literally, literally the beginning of KO 14, if you think about it. If you were to put it, to put it together, KO 13 was literally the, be, the beginning of the end for the human race as we know it, with what this demon is trying to do. And what this saga is looking like it's heading towards. It was the intro to that was not called the ultimate battle for nothing. It wasn't just about Saki, no, it was about the events coming up in the later games if they continue it. And well, they definitely they were definitely going to continue it. And this battle that's coming up is definitely an ultimate battle. This is the battle for life itself. Life, the world, mankind as a whole. This is an all-out battle. Something that Ash was going to stop long before I had the chance to happen and keep going. Now, now I mentioned Saki, I mean, not Saki, Shion. Well, here's the thing, as I stated in one of my theories in the past, Shion is, has now taken over those from the past. No one has to tell me this, SK doesn't say anything on this. I know for a fact Shion has taken control of those from the past because he was trapped in a dimension by the end of the KOF 13 events. And Shroom and Raimi ran into him and were surprised to see him, and they had a conversation. They had a legit, they had a conversation, which I'm pretty sure led to Xion taking over, and is now the new head of those from the past, and is now leading from behind the scenes. I know it's crazy. And then reading into the stories that SK put up about the prologues for each team, something interesting also came up. Now, KOF 14, again, the sequel to KOF 13, and as I said, KOF 13 is the start of KOF 14, literally. The Ikari team prologue was interesting. Why? Because they said that they are dealing with anomalies again. Get this, anomalies similar to the KOF 13 one. The exact same time in dimension anomalies that happened in KOF 13 were happening, happening in KOF 14. Now you can piece together that it's this demon, but they said it's the exact same. It's not higher, it's not lower, it is the exact same. And as y'all know, Saki was the cause for the last one. This thing has literally co has copied Saki's um, time, time dimension of rest thing going on here. It's an exact copy. This thing is continuing off from where Saki left off, except... Instead of going to take Orochi's power so he can rule mankind, no, he's going to destroy the world. This thing is picking up from where Saki left off. 
which is something that we don't see with most villains in, KO, in the KOF franchise. They don't pick off from where the last left off, except for the except for the exception of the Ash Saga, but they more or less mentioned what happened with the last, you know, boss stuff like that. They really didn't pick up. This boss is picking up from where Saki left, but it's taking it to a more extreme by destroying everything. I know, I, that's insane. It's insane, I know, it's completely crazy. But this thing, not only doesn't have ties to Orochi, but it definitely has ties to Saki it's himself. Which means that Saki, despite the fact that it seems he's dead, is still hanging around in the backseat. And not only that, the Kadash team in Kadash team prologue as well seems to be hinting at a return a nest return as well. Huh. That's interesting, because for the Kadash team, Ness was heavily implied, not just the fact that there were operatives still around, but it implies that something is going on with Ness, like it's making a return. Hmm. You know, SNK, you, uh, I'm sorry, but I think you're, you're really trying to prove my whole Ignis thing here going on right now, that Ness is possible revival. This final bat boss has ties to Orochi and Isaki. Ness seems to be on the rise. And then those from the past are still around, working from behind the scenes. And plus, there's Ron still going around too. This is not. This saga is going to be a dark battlefield saga. This is going to be a war, okay? A flat-out war. And all the heroes are going to have to come together. So that includes Kyo. Iori, although he's not much of a hero, he's considered an antagonist in most cases. But Kyo, Iori, Chizuru, Kadash, Ash, and Shune. Seven of KOF's heroes, well-known heroes, are gonna have to come together to fight to fight this battle. Oh, I forgot to mention and Kinsu. He will also be made, he will also probably become a major hero part in this saga as well. All of them are going to come together to fight this battle. This is going to be a war. This isn't going to be your normal fight to the death tournament. No, this is going to be a war. And who knows? With this thing be able to control dimensions, which also means that Nakaru is also going to play a part. But no, that means that we who knows? We just might actually get Rock Howard, Alba Mirror, like people have been asking. And maybe Luis Mayrick on an, all on a team together. Because they are also heroes. So, yeah, literally, in, in the KOF franchise, I'm not counting as Fatal Fury, but as K in KOF as a whole. But, you know, so you might, make, you might even get those characters to pop up in the saga at some point and fight this battle. This is going to be a war, alright? A flat out war. That's what this saga is heading to. KOF 13 was the start of the ultimate battle. And KOF 14 through 16 is going to continue on deeper into this ultimate battle that was referenced in the previous game. And you want to know who the spearheads going to be? The main spearheads are going to be Ash, Shune, and Kensu. Those three are going to be the main spearheads who will lead this new battle. Because those three are technically the most power. Because these three technically would be considered the most powerful heroes in the KOF saga franchise as a whole. Ash has the power of not only of his own flames but also Saki's. He died with Saki's power, or vanished with Saki's power, and used Saki's power to keep his conscience in existence. You have Kinso, who's getting stronger in his psycho power, and then Shune, who has power over illusion and these demon arms and demonic power. These three are the three strongest heroes in the franchise, and they are going to lead this battle. And I'm telling you guys now, this saga is going to be deep. There are going to be many, many returns. I can just tell you, I can feel it. There are going to be many returns. And this is going to be amazing, guys. It really, this really is. And I'm thinking now, even Saki is probably going to make a return at some point too, along with Orochi and so many other villains. But um, anyway guys, that's it for this theory, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please hit that like and subscribe button down below, it would really be appreciated. And let me know what you think. This is the final theory before the game comes out tomorrow. And 
I'm really hoping that you guys enjoy it. Um, there's just so much, guys. There is so much. Um, it, it's crazy. It really is insane. And I'm sorry for how long this video is. Like, past 30 minutes. But I had to clear this up. Ash was, the, Ash was literally going to stop all of this from happening before I had the chance. But in the end, his heroic, his heroic efforts were not only stopped by us as players, but also by Saki as a villain. So, in the end, Saki, Ash, Shion, and Ron, they, these four are responsible for the existence of KOF 14. Ash is going to erase every. Ash is going. Ash is going to change everything in the saga, and make where all these events did not happen, but got stopped by Saki and the ones who fight Ash. And due to them getting stopped, everything had to continue on. Nothing. Nothing could change. Shion now, now rules those from the past. And he's able to leave them from behind the scenes. And he's ruthless and cunning and smart. Let's not forget that. He can now lead them from behind the scenes. <sighs> you have Ron who's doing his thing with his with his clan. And what they might have planned. I don't even know what might be going on there. Then you have Orochi. And yes, Orochi. There's no other way I can put it. Then you have Orochi now who is now definitely a major threat in this saga. A definite major threat, because that seal was not put back together by the end of KOF 13. That seal was still broken. So now Orochi definitely plays a ma major part in this, and the Orochi team is gonna come back. Now this demon, with whatever it might be planning, it's going to... It's a war, guys. There's no other way to put it. This is a war, guys. And this saga is really going to make some dark turns and dark revelations. But again, guys, I love you all. Have a great day, and I will see you guys soon. And this will probably be up uploaded by when I get home tonight. But love you all, and see you later.